there are two rest motors. And they link the diagonal corners of the rest. So by driving them differentially or together, you can produce all the rotations of the wrist. Okay, so just going to go over some of the points that was covered in the CAD video with the real hand. <laughs> What's left of it? So these corrections have been done now. They're in the CAD. This is added definitely to the CAD and to the STL files, and this is still to be done, frankly. Now, Trent from IoT Design Shop has, I believe, designed that plate, so I'll have a look at that. Plan to do, I guess, not so much an upgrade as a finishing of the V1.0 early in the new year. And that will coincide with the release of all of the instructional videos. And at some point after that, I assume there'll be a 1.1 if there's enough interest. Um, what's missing, I guess, from the videos I've just done and the CAD one is this tendon, which simply wraps back and forth amongst all of the knuckles. So there are four palm bones, 3D printed. And that's all that holds them together. But what it means is that the hand's very robust. Actually, that's not all that holds them together. There's also the distal pitch joint of the wrist. Oh, yeah. And that shows you the figure eight ligament at work. So this central ligament crosses, there's one above and there's one below, and they cross inside, down this hole. And that hole is at the centre of your rotation, which is that. It means that it doesn't have any effect on the pitch rotations, and they are linked by that figure eight ligament, which crosses over. It's not perfect. It's a bit of free play. That doesn't matter yet. We'll see as we get more precise and try and repeat actions if that has an, has an impact. Anyway, so that's the wrist figure eight. Central yaw constraint. And you can see how all the PTFE tubes pass down through the centre of the wrist. An important decision to be made is whether or not you pass them above or below the pitch joints. In this case, they're generally, after looking at them, passing above. Actually, not so for the thumb. The thumb passes through the middle of this bulkhead. You have to clean those holes out with a long two mil drill. And then you'll find which, which servo they go down. And then you'll find which servo they go down to. There are two wrist motors. And they link the diagonal corners of the wrist. So by driving them differentially or together, you can produce all the rotations of the wrist. I wasn't convinced. I must have actually. First time I made it. I wasn't, I wasn't a hundred percent it would work. Just fundamentally, but there's something wrong with it. It just seemed too, too neat. But it's a lovely little neck. You have a little bit of preload when you put it together, running over various kinds of bearings. Uh, a couple of points to clarify from the video. Yes, so in fact, the clamping for that central wrist ligament. 
the back hole, which is a two mil hole, takes a two mil pin. And that allows that right angle turn, wrap it around, clamp it down. So the larger hole at the front should be drilled out to the back, which I'll add in fact to the Academy STL. The larger hole on the left is for an insert and for screwing and clamping. And the smaller hole at the back is a two mil pin. And that's what gives the ligament enough strength. Again, it should be preloaded a bit. Thumb elastics are all uh, broken now. That used to pull it down to here. Oh, yeah, actually, I guess that needs to be done as well. So the V1, a little bit incomplete. The V1, a little bit incomplete. But can be brought to a working state. I guess I can show you the insert into pieces well, actually. Right, what do I need for that? Most of the screws, these are M2 countersunk of varying lengths, of varying lengths, and they take a torque six. Rather handily, a torque six would also undo an M2 cap head Allen key. Nice when these things work for you. Okay, so, yes indeed, there is a detail. This servo needs to have the cable wrapped around it over the top so that these things can be taken to pieces. Right, long time since I've done this. So this servo remains attached to this piece. And on this particular hand, in fact, this screw is broken. There should be a third screw up here. And I snapped it off by accident. So this is not quite how it should be because it still gets caught on it as it comes up. I just left it on there to add some way to anchor. And there you can see how that particular servo is attached to the end of a tendon. Oh, that cable's got really crunched. That's something to watch out for. But normally it needs to sit in that gap there. Crikey, that has got crunched. Huh. Well, there we go. <laughs> Something to watch out for. Yet another thing to watch out for. Right, and then this insert. Take some of that wrist tendon there as well. And you can see that these are the larger wrist servos. which is indeed a very tight fit there, as it was in the CAD. But it's okay in real life. And that's the top of the number one insert, which holds that servo there. Hmm. Try and work out what caused that to get pinched so badly. Can't tell if it's the servo itself, which would explain why it suddenly stopped working. I think it is. I think so. That I think that cable has just been made a little bit too tight. And it's pulling it up into the path of this servo as it turns. So it will eventually, <laughs> eventually, it will break itself, which is a common problem in robots. Yes. Indeed, it gets caught. So one of my objectives is always to make a robot which doesn't destroy itself as it operates. Harder said, harder done than said. Right, back here we also have the box of electronics. So all of the servo cables come through here. You can see quite a few have broken from being flexed. It's an awkward job. I soldered them onto the bottom of the Arduino Mega. 
This is the S bus input, which means you can control it with standard radio gear. Taking a peek under there, that's XB wireless serial receiver. And this is the VTEC TTL adapter board, which takes micro signals and sends them out to the serial bus, which drives in this case, just these two and also the big rotator. And by using serial servers there, you do get some advantages. Obviously, it's a little bit more technical. And if you've only used, if you've only ever used legacy RC servers before, there is of course gonna be a tiny learning curve. Uh, <laughs> this is how I connected to the batteries, just by wedging some copper in. Not great, I agree. And that is a DC DC. Now I've been trying to find some of these which are not copied, are not um, counterfeit essentially, and I've been un unable to do so. You can find these very commonly all over the shop, um, but apparently the chip number is just sprayed on. It's not real. It's not a real thing. It, uh, when people have analysed them, they just work completely differently to the real ones. It works, but it does blow up every once in a while. Um, so a little bit underpowered that I think long term that will disappear and you'll pipe in power of the uh, to charge the batteries and then the batteries will supply the juice when it's needed. Anywho, that's to come later. Uh, what can we say about the thumb? You can see it can rotate like this. Normally there's a band to pull it across and a tendon which pulls it back and that allows the thumb rotation to actually be active, which is slightly more than most humans can do. Looks like lost a bearing there. And of course, always an extension of the middle finger servo. This, in fact, is a repair, so ignore that one. But that's the one there, just extended with short lengths of cable. The rest reach down to here. OK. just clamps down like that. There we go. 